So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Catherine Wilhelm, uh, Executive Director of the USA Asia Law Institute at NYU Law School. And I'm very pleased to welcome Ned Levin to be uh, part of our speaker series, Long Overdue Invitation. Uh, I first met Ned in Beijing uh, in the early 2010s after he had completed his undergraduate Silk Road studies and was honing his already amazingly impressive Uyghur and Chinese language skills and trying to decide whether to pursue a career in journalism or in law. And he ultimately made the choice to do both, uh, which uh, I highly applaud. So first he was a correspondent for the Wall Street Journal based in Hong Kong and then in Istanbul. And then he went to law school, became a lawyer, uh, he has worked at a hedge fund to investigate misconduct by listed companies, which includes examining their supply chains in China. And that's where we get to the subject uh, of today's talk um, for evidence of forced labor use. He has his own law firm now in Washington, and his clients include media and finance companies, as well as individual Uyghurs who are seeking asylum in the United States. So we have a lot to talk about. Uh, forced labor is the main focus, but we also will talk a little bit, I hope at the end, about the situation of Uyghurs who are seeking uh, asylum here and possibly in other places as well. So with that, Ned, uh, the mic is yours. Um, thanks so much, Catherine. It, thanks so much for having me here. It's um, fun to be here. I'm not sure I've seen you for about a decade, but um, to present to one of my early bosses is a rare privilege. And so um, uh, let's let's get to it. Um, the topic of this talk is advocating for Uyghurs in China and the United States. Um, one point to make uh, up front is that Uyghurs are very capable of advocating for themselves. Uh, I'm not Uyghur. I'm here talking about uh, advocating for Uyghurs. But actually, when we talk about Uyghurs advocating for themselves, the connection between forced labor legislation and enforcement and U.S. immigration policy really becomes pretty apparent. Um, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act itself is in large part the result of advocacy by Uyghurs and Uyghur Americans in particular. Uh, to give you some examples, Uyghur American journalists at Radio Free Asia broke many of the major stories about arrests and forced labor uh, in the Uyghur region. A Uyghur American advocacy groups, such as the Uyghur American Association, have organized and protested loudly uh, over Uyghur forced labor. Uh, a Uyghur American Senate staffer was deeply involved in the passage of the UFLPA itself. And just about every subsequent major revelation about forced labor in the Uyghur region has involved research by Uyghurs. Uh, so advocating for Uyghurs, in my view, is really about helping them get to positions where they can safely advocate for themselves. Um, it, so that's really where I see the connection between the UFLPA and asylum, um, chiefly in two ways. One, uh, for a Uyghur, it is genuinely baffling that the United States has put hundreds of millions of dollars uh, into enforcement aimed at improving the situation of their people. Um, international supply chains have been and are being remade ostensibly on Uyghur's behalf. Um, yet, uh, USCIS cannot process Uyghur asylum applications that were filed five, ten years ago. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are explanations that have nothing to do with Uyghurs as to why the asylum system in this country is, is broken, but it is um, just from the perspective of a Uyghur individual, you see both the tremendous power that the United States can wield uniquely, uh, as well as um, our inability to do something that seems like it should be pretty straightforward. Uh, but if we're serious about helping Uyghurs and about helping advance the uh, stated goals of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, um, we need to help Uyghurs help themselves. Uh, pending asylees, you, in, if you wish to travel abroad, there's, there's quite a lot of effort now being put toward um, 
getting the European Union on board uh, with forced labor um, preventions, uh, lobbying internationally. The most effective people uh, to advocate for that are themselves Uyghurs. However, uh, if your Chinese passport has expired uh, and you have not yet been given U.S. passport, you have to get an international travel document. You must renew that every year. Functionally, that means you have to renew it every six months because no country will issue you a visa if your travel document is expiring within six months. Um, it's expensive. Um, we can get into all of uh, the ways in which the immigration system, the, the immigration situation for Uyghurs is also harming broader policy efforts on their behalf in this country. But but so that's the connection, putting Uyghurs in a position to actually do a lot of the work that will go into effectively enforcing the law. Um, so we're going to talk today about forced labor and what it is. Um, I think a key takeaway conceptually is that participation in forced labor, government-sponsored forced labor projects is its own form of corporate social responsibility in China. This, this is, and we'll get into that more, but I think that's really the key insight here. Um, we will then talk about how uh, a depression era uh, law, the, the Tariff Act of 1930, has been revitalized um, through the passage of the Weaker Forced Labor Prevention Act, um, and then we'll get back into talking about uh, asylum issues. On forced, so to, to start with forced labor, it is incredible to me as someone who's studied um, the Uyghur region and Uyghurs for a couple of decades now, uh, the extent to which I don't have to explain things when I go to public talks anymore about who the Uyghurs are, where they live, what their situation is. I think people are broadly familiar by this point uh, with what has happened um, to the Uyghurs, um, really going back decades, but intensifying with the system of uh, detention camps uh, that were rolled uh, out province-wide around 2016. Um, forced labor is just one subset of the campaign against the Uyghurs that's been unleashed by the Chinese government. Um, and I, we, we don't really have the scope to get into everything else that's been happening in the Uyghur region. Um, forced labor itself has a very long history among Uyghurs and in the Uyghur region predating the advent of the PRC. And I think that's an important context to this. Um, most of the Uyghur population in northern Xinjiang was, in fact, enslaved and moved there by the Dzungar dynasty in order to till the land. Um, even when I was living in Gulja as a student, there would still be in the summer what's called hashar. Um, these are public works projects for which the government can conscript whoever they want to work for free. And then there are elaborate systems where relatively wealthy people buy their way out of having to perform labor. But it's a, I remember there was a like a big part of a highway was being built uh, in the town just to the north of where I was living. And all the Uyghur men were conscripted to help construct this room. Mm -hmm. um, since 2014, and, and that's been the case, you know, for cotton, there's just been a long history of uh, rulers of the Uyghur region viewing uh, Uyghur labor as uh, free and disposable and at their command. Uh, since around 2014, a couple different interrelated processes have happened. One, as a matter of industrial policy, uh, China sought to unlock uh, what sometimes gets called captive coal, uh, the 40% of China's coal reserves that are in Xinjiang. And previously, uh, expensive to transport out, not very good transportation links. And so the idea is we burn all that coal in situ and we use it to build up uh, massive energy intensive industries, uh, most notably polysilicon, uh, but also aluminum. Um, and it's this, this insight to uh, 
use all of this energy that then brings a lot of industry into Xinjiang. Um, there are all sorts of government incentives and subsidies to encourage companies to farm, mine, or manufacture in the Uyghur region. Um, at the same time, uh, we do have internment camps uh, being rolled out. It's been estimated that between 900,000 and 1.8 million uh, minoritized citizens have been taken in for cultural and political indoctrination uh, in, in the Uyghur region. Um, there are also have been many trials and sentencing of the entire Uyghur intellectual class. Um, and finally, there has been uh, the move to mobilize what gets called um, surplus labor. Uh, no, so what is surplus labor? The PRC government does not recognize traditional Uyghur forms of work or farming as legitimate labor. Um, and so they seek to develop the region by forcing Uyghurs to work in factories. Um, there's a region-wide program that monitors every single system, every single citizen assigns them points uh, and then assigns them into a labor transfer. In, in 2021, uh, the Uyghur region government reported as many as 3.2 million people transferred through state-sponsored labor programs. Uh, the government has mandated that at least one person from every household in the southern Uyghur, Uyghur region accept a state-mandated labor transfer to a factory or farm. Mm -hmm. um, there are also work mandates. Everyone who is able to work must be in some form of work in the Uyghur region. Um, this work uh, can take place um, in a number of different uh, forms. Uh, refusal to participate um, for reasons that can be perceived to be linked to religion in the view of the government is tantamount to aligning yourself with what are called the three evils of separatism, terrorism, and religious extremism. Functionally, if a party cadre in your local village comes to knock on your door and ask that you or your son and your daughter take a work placement, um, you, you cannot refuse. Refusing uh, the job risks uh, internment or imprisonment. Um, conditions in uh, um, uh, conditions for Uyghurs who are involved in these enforced labor uh, tend to align uh, with the International Labor Organization's 11 indicators of forced labor, including abuse of vulnerability, deception, restriction of movement, isolation, intimidation and threats, retention of identity documents, withholding of wages, and debt bondage. Um, it used to be that I would get um, some disputes noting that Uyghurs often in these conditions are in fact paid salaries. That is true. Um, they don't have anything meaningful way to decline work assignments that they're given um, that still constitutes forced labor. Uh, so, and as this, uh, as the Xinjiang region has been industrialized and as uh, Uyghur forced labor has been um, mobilized, uh, access effective access by auditing firms uh, to the Uyghur region is non-existent. Um, all credible firms now refuse to conduct audits uh, in the region. Uh, there's 2021 PRC legislation that makes it illegal to assist in the implementation of a foreign sanction on China. That's had a chilling effect. There were raids uh, on due diligence firms last year in China. Um, so functionally, there is no way to uh, see whether there's there's no way for an auditor to discover whether or not forced labor is being used uh, in among uh, involving Uyghur laborers. Um, there just is not any way to find that out. Um, so why do all this? Why is the Chinese government doing all this? Uh, control uh, of the Uyghur population. Uh, is key. Uh, I think there's also, there are views that the Uyghurs are backward, um, that they are susceptible uh, to religious extremism, and that this can be tempered by a form of 
reformation through labor. Um, I mean, this persistent belief in the party that people can be reformed uh, by some through some kind of incarcerated process um, in which, which transforms them into good Chinese citizens and productive uh, Chinese citizens. Um, there's also, with all of the industry that's moved to the region, uh, there's a need for cheap labor. Um, and uh, there's also, I think that, yeah, that about covers that we covered the ideological piece as well. Um, there's, there really is this belief that Uyghurs are backward and need to be reformed. Um, industries affected by this. So 20% 20, 20 of global cotton production, 25% of global tomato paste, 45% of polysilicon, and 12% of aluminum uh, all originate in the Uyghur region. Um, there are, but that's really just the beginning. Um, I could list tomatoes, dates, uh, food additives. There's a lot of growing of African marigold to make lutein. Uh, uh, textiles and apparel, uh, polyvinyl chloride, pharmaceuticals, uh, automotive parts. Um, and these are all core industrial materials. Uh, and with this amount of the global supply uh, being implicated, uh, it's, it's easy to see how this can slip into supply chains across the world and indeed continue to be readily available on Amazon. You know, it's, it's very, these materials are everywhere and they continue to be everywhere. Um, so uh, the UFPLA, UFL, uh, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act uh, was signed into law on December 23rd, 2021. Uh, what it actually does is it strengthens Section 307 of the Tariff Act of 1930, which prohibits the importation of products made with forced labor. Um, there's not much of a process uh, prescribed by Section 307 of the Tariff Act. Basically, anyone can report forced labor goods to CBP. The CBP commissioner investigates as appears warranted, and if the commissioner finds information that reasonably but not conclusively indicates that imports may be the product of forced labor, they issue uh, what's called an order to withhold release. The importer has three months to contest, and they must demonstrate that every reasonable effort has been made to determine the source and type of labor used to produce the merchandise. Um, up until 2015, there was something called the consumptive demand clause, which said that uh, forced labor products are allowed uh, if no comparable product made in the U.S. is made in the U.S. or if U.S. production does not meet consumptive demand. Um, there were no uh, withhold release orders issued between 2000 and 2016. So from the time that China acceded to the WTO, really up until the launch of the genocide, there was no CBP enforcement um, of the tariff act whatsoever. Uh, the UFLPA gets signed into law and it has um, two key components. Uh, one is uh, the FLEDIF strategy, the Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force, which is an interagency task force chaired by DHS, um, that is responsible for maintaining uh, five statutory lists um, of entities. Uh, first, those that are uh, mining, producing, manufacturing wholly, or in part in Xinjiang. Uh, those who are working with the uh, Xinjiang government to recruit, transport, transfer, harbor, or receive forced labor, uh, a list of products made with forced labor, um, exporters of forced labor products from China to the U.S., and facilities and entities that source material from uh, Xinjiang or from persons working with the government of Xinjiang for the purposes of po the poverty alleviation program or the pairing assistance program. Uh, there are 41 listed entities currently, some of them overlap. It's been suggested that these uh, statutory lists are overlapping and somewhat confusing. Uh, but the end effect is that if 
uh, Fledif makes a determination to add you to an entity in the U.S., then not only are your products excluded, but any product that um, conceivably involves something that you have manufactured is also excluded from the United States. Um, the UFLPA also institutes a rebuttable presumption uh, that products uh, made in whole or in part in Xinjiang uh, have been made with forced labor. Um, and and to, to rebut this presumption, you must show that you have fully complied with all government regulations regarding forced labor and responded to all inquiries um, from the commissioner, which can be uh, can be a lot. We can get into that. Um, the UFLPA, uh, and then you must demonstrate by clear and convincing evidence that there is no nexus to forced labor. Um, the UFLPA is not separately funded. Uh, however, Congress allocated over $100 million last year, last fiscal year, and is allocating over $110 million this fiscal year to forced labor enforcement. Um, which is a lot. Um, so how has enforcement been going? Um, we can look at the UFLPA statistics dashboard, which DHS helpfully lists on its website. Good. Um, so you know, they have this top line value of 2.87 billion in shipments. However, that actually includes the, you, you see more than half of the shipments have actually been released. This is to say um, CBP uh, excluded these goods. They, the, the importer followed up and eventually they were able to show via clear and convincing evidence that there was no connection to weak or forced labor. So almost, it, if you look at this, almost half of the enforcement actions results in the release of the shipment. Um, this is maybe a little, whoops, okay. Um, in terms of country of origin, you would think it's going to be, China is going to be the main player, but actually, China, let's see. China is dwarfed by Malaysia and Thailand. Let's see how clearly this should be. Um, Malaysia and Thailand have had far more uh, shipments stopped than from China. Um, I think this is primarily uh, polysilicon and solar panel manufacturers who uh, have been sourcing either metallurgical grade silicon uh, or other components from within China. So this is numbers of shipment, not size, nothing to do with the size well, of the so shipment. There's nothing to do with the size shipment. of the shipment, just numbers of shipments. And each each shipment held is its own. What does shipment mean? It doesn't mean a ship. That's a good, yeah. What, what it, could be a, it could be a pallet. It could be a pallet. It could, it be, could be an be envelope. Box. Yeah, it could be, um, it could be anything. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about Small the de minimis exception. Yes. As a container ship. Yes. Okay. Whatever comes in, when it comes in, as CBP finds and determines it. Right. Um, and let's see, there used to be, if we look at the all of the denied. What you'll notice, this is still, you know, it's not the best data visualization, but we're comparing the three and a half years of its, um, we're really, no, two, we're comparing the almost two years that it's been in effect. And one thing that I will note is that uh, fiscal year 2024, um, There has been a surge of enforcement in fiscal year 2024, if I can. It doesn't look at yeah, it. No, it, it certainly does not. This is the denied, you've got denied. Yeah. Um, maybe you want everything? Oh. There's definitely been more enforcement early this year. Okay. Yeah, there we yeah, go. There we go. There we go. Okay. To be, to be seen whether they're denied or not. And to be seen, well, we can also see how many are pending.
Yeah. So we have a lot of pending shipments uh, from February. Okay. And when they're when they're denied and in the pending process, they are held in port. What happens to them? Yeah, they're they're held in. I mean, uh, they are held in. Port. Yes. Yeah. So so that's a cost to the manager of the port. The whole logistic system that has to deal with is being choked by these shipments that are being held. Yes, depending on how large they are and what the circumstances are, uh, that's certainly an issue. And if they're finally denied, then what happens? Are they destroyed? There's nothing. So nothing in the UFLPA provides clear okay. instructions as to what to do. Um, in many cases, I believe the shipments can just be re redirected abroad. I don't know that there's statutory authority to say destroy. So the company that was going to bring them in and sell them here could decide to try to sell them in another marketplace. I believe so. Yes. Okay. Um, so... I think we're getting one of the things we're getting at here is that it's not this is not a very easy law to comply with, uh, even as a good faith actor. Mm -hmm. um, when CBP uh, lets you know that they are uh, you know, that there's a Uyghur forced labor issue with your shipment, they will genuinely they generally tell you which of the statutory lists uh, your issue falls under. <laughs> Um, and then they will give you the opportunity to provide information and they'll, 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 uh, they are long and exhaustive lists on the CBP website as to what kind of information you can produce. But crucially, um, you don't, many companies don't get a very clear communication about what the specific forced labor issue is. What is the component? What is the evidence that it was made by forced labor? What what opportunities does the company have to to rebut? Um, and I know just just being aware of time, there's a lot more to get into there. Uh, but I think in general on UFLPA enforcement, it's um, if. It's the subject of some consternation by importers and attorneys. Uh, the There's not much of a laid out process for companies to contest uh, their shipments being excluded. Um, there are issues with government investigations that prevent the government from sharing certain uh, information. In particular, it appears that at least some shipments have been stopped because of individual informants who have reached out to DHS. Um, so that's an obstacle, but uh, I think a lot of importers are quite unhappy with uh, what they perceive as the lack of transparency and an inability to conclusively demonstrate that uh, you're, you're trying to prove a negative on a more demanding standard of proof, clear and convincing evidence, then the government was required to put uh, an entity on the list in the first place, which is just reasonableness. Mm -hmm. um, so it's tough. Uh, Can I interject a yes. question about that? Because this presumption... Yes. When you're talking about standards, this presumption seem, that's set forth in the law seems to be at the heart of the issue, right? So specifically, what is the presumption? Is the presumption that it seems as, as if, and I think I heard you say, if it's made in Xinjiang, there's a presumption that it involves forced labor. So yes. that, there's no standard there of any level of evidence. It's just it's made in, it's made in Xinjiang. Right. So I guess the evidence would pertain to, do you have evidence that it's made in Xinjiang? Yes. So, so the presumption it's made in Xinjiang, but what is there a presumption if it's made if it's made with any Uyghur labor anywhere in the chain somewhere else? So that's additional on on top of being made. So because it may have been made in Jiangsu, or, yes. you know, in eastern China, it could, may have been made as you said in, in Malaysia. Um, and then still further, is there also a presumption? Um, that it might have been made with labor from Xinjiang that is not Uyghur. So in other words, Kazakh or another yep. minority. Is that also part of the presumption? How, what exactly is the yeah, that's technical a, scope of the presumption? That's um, that's a contested question um, that we can, let's see. 
Um, but the, basically, the, 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 the key aspect of the presumption is that if it's made in Xinjiang, it's made with forced labor, and that is something that you can rebut. It's not concerned with, with Uyghurs or specifically uh, other Turkic minorities, as we know, have been conscripted into forced labor programs as well. Mm -hmm. Separate from that, there's then these entities lists, mm -hmm. right? So the rebuttable presumption, as far as I understand, pertains mainly to, like, was it made in Xinjiang or not? Okay. Uh, the entities lists then are if you have been if you, these these are companies known to have used Uyghur forced labor in one way or another, and if they are your suppliers, you are also viewed as having used forced labor. And the mechanism for that is very much individual companies being put on entities lists mm -hmm. as opposed to some generalized determination about the presence of Uyghur forced labor. Um, a big issue here, which I didn't delineate, is, of course, um, these labor transfer programs happen both for people um, from southern Xinjiang who are then transferred within Xinjiang, but then also uh, individuals who are transferred from Xinjiang to eastern Chinese cities uh, for work. And there have been all sorts of uh, investigations and revelations about uh, seafood processing, um, electronics. Um, so hey, we seem to have jumped into the questions. I can talk a little bit about um, asylum as well, if we'd like, or we can just, we can get into your questions. I mean, I have more notes to talk about here, but I'm, I'm a, I've gone over my 15 minutes already. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, well, let's, let's, let's get into questions. Um, what do we actually know about the numbers of people, the numbers of Uyghurs who, or others, other, uh, including even Han, um, who are believed to be engaged in forced labor in China, um, using this definition of, yes, they may be compensated, they're not slave labor, they may be compensated, but th this was not labor of their choice. So that would include uh, the labor in um, in prisons, yes, of course, China and 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 many of those prisoners would be ethnically uh, Han Chinese. Um, do we have numbers, guesses? I'm not there. I'm not familiar with estimates as to the the entire forced labor force of um, in in China. Uh, the Xinjiang government, provincial governments, most of what we know uh, about the number of people implicated is from uh, Chinese government announcements. Mm -hmm. um, mentioning that labor transfers and forced labor is a form of CSR, this is government policy and it's something that local officials are proud of when they meet their quotas. And CSR, corporate social corporate responsibility. Corporate social responsibility. So it's a so if you're if you are a company in the Chinese interior who has accepted uh, Uyghur forced labor, it is possible, and there have been many instances where you will post on your website stating as such because you are fulfilling your duty as a patriotic company to uh, follow the CCP line, and so and, and helping poverty alleviation and helping with the poverty alleviation program, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not. You know, we can't really, I'm not going to um, speculate as to the, the mental state of whatever a Chinese factory boss who takes on uh, Uyghurs may or may not think about what they are doing. Um, but so much of what has happened in the Uyghur region over the past six, seven years has really occurred out in the open. Government has said what it's going to do, and then it's, then it's done it. And so I think I cited a figure of... Um, around 3 million people that the government itself reported as transferring through state-sponsored labor programs in 2021. Um, that's only increased. And in, th in fact, I think Uyghur labor transfers as we talk about um, the genocide, all of the policies that have been brought to bear on Uyghurs. I think um, this, this project to uh, control particularly rural populations in Xinjiang by moving young people elsewhere, uh, both both within and without, that's that's going to continue and that appears to only be accelerating. Mm -hmm. Even as we've had reports of, say, uh, internment camps, these re-education camps largely being closed down. 
there there does seem to have been an acceleration in the in the use of Uyghur largely closely. closed down. You feel comfortable saying that there. That's a it's a contentious uh -huh. uh, point, but there certainly are fewer people being sent to the kind of centers that we were all reading about in 2017. How is what is the sources of evidence we have other you know with all the challenges of knowing what's going on in Xinjiang I mean that's one thing I've been wondering how do we know that there's less people how do we know that they're right I mean, so that's 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 why this is all con contentious right because we don't have auditors on the ground so if you're asking about what our what our sources of information is it's really what local governments say hmm. uh and provincial governments say um, and they, you know, if you, you can, even today, even, even right now, I could go, uh, search for a U.S. listed company, uh, that proudly talks about participating in the poverty alleviation program and accepting transfer of however many Uyghurs, um, it's, it's quite in the open. Um, I mean, the, uh, an interest, another interesting aspect of that for me is um, it's in the open because they don't think there's anything wrong with it, right? It's in the open because uh, the feeling is Uyghurs need to be reformed. How generous uh, it is of us to provide uh, employment for them. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think there's a, I mean, as a former journalist, like secret knowledge, big scoops are very, you know, people tend to pay more attention to them. But really what we know is is what the government has said publicly about what it's doing. Um that's that's my best answer. Um as as far as like where does this idea of um internment camps having run out, I mean I think part of part of that honestly comes from my own uh asylum practice and the stories that I hear from people. Um also Anecdotally, uh, Uyghurs with relatives uh, who are still in the region seem to at least, you know, some people seem to at least be able to talk to relatives now in a way that wasn't possible previously. But you're right, it's all, we don't really know. We don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I went back and, and did a little searching for when forced labor of Uyghurs seems to have begun. Yeah. And you mentioned this program that workers were expected to contribute to public works yeah. projects, which of course has a long history in China and in many countries. Um, I did find mention um, as early as uh, 2007, there were news stories in English being published about students uh, during the summertime being asked to pick cotton and that kind of thing. Was that organized by local governments? Was that a policy of the Xinjiang government? Was it a policy of the central government? I'm wondering, I ask that in part because I'm wondering whether um, the project has become uh, larger because it was taken over by the center. Mm, okay. Um, I mean, I think in general, and not just with forced labor, um, but with surveillance, with mass internment, Xinjiang has been kind of like uh, local prefectural or lower level Xinjiang governments have been test beds for all sorts of methods that then have been rolled out on a province wide basis and even on a on a national basis. Mm -hmm. I don't know in terms of like Hashar policy as I witnessed it seem pretty informal. I don't know that there was ever, but I don't, there's, there should be an answer to this question. There's, I don't know. I don't know if there was ever a center, a central directive that, you know, Uyghurs need to pick the cotton. Um, if there was, I'm not aware of it. Um, For other populations in China, that seems to have stopped with the end of the communes, more or less. Right. Yes. Um, but Xinjiang is its own state of exception. And, you know, one of you it stopped with the end of the communes, um, the Xinjiang production and construction poor, uh, quasi-military, quasi-governmental organization that um, manages a, a, a huge proportion of Xinjiang's economic output. I mean, that that's a creature of that collectivization mm -hmm. era, and it still largely runs the province. So it is the, the Bingtuan, the XPCC, has historically been involved in organizing Uyghurs for, for forced labor for quite some time. I want to talk about that a little bit. There may be people 
um, especially online, who are not so familiar with uh, yes. the production? Um, so the the um, uh, the XPCC uh, is actually one of, I believe, three uh, similar provincial level organizations that were formed in the 50s to Kaipo, uh, what is the, to, um, to, develop. to, yes, to, to develop the, you know, underdeveloped regions. So there was one in Mongolia that I think got disbanded. Um, I want to say there was maybe even one in Northern Heilongjiang um, mm -hmm. that was involved in, but um, there, it was not just. That would have been during the Cultural Revolution when all of the students were sent there, maybe. Yes, I think. Um, or at least th there was definitely one in Inner Mongolia. Um, the one that survives to the present day is the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps, which um, owns, you know, some significant proportion of Xinjiang real estate, mm -hmm. uh, ha is, has numerous entities listed, um, you know, not just on the entities list, but also that are um, listed companies uh, on the Shanghai and Shenzhen exchanges. Mm -hmm. That's actually where we get a lot of our information about the XPCC and about forced labor programs. Mm -hmm. Um, is it itself now established as a company? Has it been registered as a company or is it a so it, political entity? It's a government. It's, it's a political entity. Yeah, it's a political entity. And then under it, it has a huge corporate, uh, like, you know, hundreds of corporate entities, mm -hmm. um, some of which themselves may be individually listed mm -hmm. on an exchange. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, it, is this quasi-military organization that has also been uh, deeply active in the mobilization of the Uyghur forced labor force. How big is it? How big is the Bingtuan? I wouldn't, I wouldn't really know how to answer that question, but um, probably something like half of Xinjiang's economic output. Okay. Uh, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, all the natural resources, uh, almost all the farming. Um, so almost all of those cotton fields that are producing, what did you say, 20% uh, of yes, the world's cotton? Yes, our XPCC. Are from the bean plant. Yes, from the yes. Production and construction, construction core. core. Xinjiang construction, Production and Construction Core. Yes. So employs hundreds of thousands of people. Yes. Um, I, Historically, in um, uh, like cities and um, well, they're used called tuan, so cores that are, uh, you know, not not dissimilar from various settler colonial enterprises uh, in human civilization, uh, not just China, but um, and and it has long been part, it has long been XPCC practice to conscript leaders to pick cotton. So can we assume that all of the registered companies that are under the, the uh, production and construction core are on one of the entity lists? I think uh, the, the core itself is on an entity list, and I think then every, every subsidiary is also, yes, mm -hmm. necessarily. I've seen criticisms uh, from uh, various activist groups, Wii groups, that um, of the Customs and Border Patrol, that they're not you know, enforcing the law aggressively enough, not doing as much as they can. And they will argue that there are uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of companies, Chinese companies that are known uh, to employ Uyghur labor or forced labor or use the components from it or in some way be connected uh, to this and that they're known or knowable uh, to be doing engaged in this and yet are not on the list, the list as you said, in total, including overlaps, is 41 companies. Four, as that's I counted you know, yesterday, yeah. I, I believe the hundreds of thousands figure comes from a researcher in England um, who has compiled a database. Um, so those, the gap by any measure seems large. What What is going on there? How knowable, unknowable is this really? Yeah, uh, and I think that one, there's, there's nothing spelled, there's very little spelled out about how FLEDIF, uh, the Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force, and CBP should be enforcing the UFLPA. Mm. Uh, and there is a lot of consternation with how slow they've been to add to the entity lists. Mm. Um, 
just five days ago, I think I believe DHS actually put out a memo saying that um, they are seeking. They they've been saying for quite some time that they're going to add to the entities list expeditiously. I think they probably. I wouldn't be surprised if we did see a lot of additions over the next several months. Um, but it's um, you basically the uflpa revived uh, a piece of legislation that's 100 years old that itself had no very clear provisions for determining what what's forced labor what's made with forced labor and cbp and fledif have had to come up with their enforcement strategy not completely on the fly but um it's it's been a very dramatic uh turn of events uh, both for the agency's task with enforcing and, of course, with importers who previously having not thought about who their second tier suppliers are for one second, then um, receive notice that their goods are being withheld. Um, that's something that is, it's a very live issue. Um, one, there. And there's not there's there I think one way that it will continue to get um, shook out is that as over these past two years DHS has um, uh, expanded on the guidance that it's offered uh, and I think like slowly slowly we're working our way toward a somewhat more transparent process for adding to the entity list but um, as it is right now it's it's pretty close it's a uh, it's an intergovernmental uh task force that's chaired by dhs uh there's also ustr state commerce treasury labor justice and some observer that's agencies high level guidance setting team i would assume that but they also vote on working, who's the working level is all the working level is is primarily dhs mm -hmm. um but the the votes are by the members Let's kind of go back to the question i asked about this big gap between 41 entities on yep. the list and alleged or reported, you know, tens of thousands uh, in reality, is the gap that on this side at the working level, the people who are deciding which companies or entities to put on the list are looking to satisfy some level of proof? I mean, again, could go back to this question of what's presumed and what's not presumed and what's yeah. standard. Um, if it's in Xinjiang, boom, you know, you'd think that every company in Xinjiang would be on the list. Yes. So that that I find I, that's part of what I find confusing, you know. Um, if there's some basis for them being on in the database uh, that's been created by the advocates, yeah. um, they would have some evidence, presumably. Can they not hand it over to uh, Customs and Border Patrol, or yeah. is it accessible to them, but it's in Uyghur and Customs and Border um, doesn't have. Uyghur readers? I th um, DHS pays a lot of attention to uh, what the advocacy community, the research that the advocacy community has produced. In fact, I think you mentioned um, the list uh, compiled by researchers at Sheffield Hallam University. Not that list, but reports that Sheffield Hallam have put out over the past mm -hmm. five years or so. Um, there's a pretty strong correlation between companies that they mention and companies that get added to the entities list, which suggests uh, a lack of capacity within the government to engage in what's pretty complex and challenging research. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no real precedent for it and there's no uh there's no clear there's there's no clear and easy way to point at a good and say that this was made with forced labor i guess the, what you just said there's no precedent for it is what's most striking yes for me as an outsider to this issue because it has been illegal since 1930 and actually i see others saying well actually in previous laws prior to the 1930 tariff act it was also already illegal to bring in uh, goods made with forced labor, or prison labor, child labor, and so on. So it's been illegal for almost a century, and yet it's unprecedented to try to enforce them. Is that is that a fair summary? 
So we've had it on this law in the books, but we haven't actually built up any kind of muscle. Well, it took us until 2015 to um, for Congress to remove the consumptive demand exception to the 1930 Tariff Act, which says that basically if like if I want to buy something and the only way as an American as the all powerful American consumer, mm -hmm. if I want to buy something and the only outfit that makes it uses forced labor, that's fine. And, you know, I can import it. I can, I can use it. Mm -hmm. um, the concern of the 1930 law is American comp manufacturing competitiveness mm -hmm. with countries that are using forced labor. Mm -hmm. um, so if no one's competing, then it doesn't matter. And so there still have been there have been withhold release orders issued um, prior to the passage of the UFLPA, but not a lot. Um, so yeah, I think this this law was pretty much underutilized until uh, 20, 2015 and has only really been revitalized with the UFLPA. Right, because we did have within my recent memory um, instances of public outrage consumer campaigns to for example drive out you know blood diamonds yeah. from the from the marketplace um i remember a very effective campaign against jade you know publicizing the horrible working conditions of the jade miners in myanmar um so it seems like we've had those kinds of public campaigns to but it was always on the consumer level that consumers needed to be outraged consumers needed to organize themselves and to go to companies and try to name and shame and say you know your diamonds are tainted or um, your oil is being mined from this company it's a your mining extraction activities are fueling a civil war whatever it might be yeah um so no no muscle being developed on the government side and no real attempt on the government side to 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 get involved. Yeah. Overstatement. Um I'll have to think about that for for a second. I think the I think a key distinction to make about uh Uyghur forced labor issues in particular is the government involvement and the scale of government involvement. I think part of the thesis of uh consumer boycotts is that company individual companies are going to be susceptible to consumers going to them and saying, I'm not going to buy your goods until you find a different supplier. And then they find a different supplier and the world is made right again. Mm -hmm. In in the Xinjiang context, we don't have all the information we need about what's going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, the scale of the government-sponsored campaign is massive. Uh, the, incenti uh, the incentives for companies, given China's uh, economic power are also somewhat different. I, as a as an individual consumer, I'm actually, you know, based off of my own experience living in Xinjiang, I'm keenly interested in not purchasing I, any item that has been made with Uyghur forced labor. And I also possess the investigative tools to be able to look into that. And yet, when I'm buying stuff for my two year old daughter, it's to, I I have to admit that there's just there's there's no way for me as a consumer to feel confident mm -hmm. uh, because I also can't no no company is going to make a pub very very few companies are going to make a public representation that we listen to uh, our cons you know our customers and we think <laughs> the bigger force labor in China is very very bad and so we've made sure it's not there like I just challenge you to find a major company that is going to mm -hmm. say that uh because they are afraid of ang rightly afraid of angering China and to the extent they have any business interests on the ground in China which they must if we're talking about them exporting mm -hmm. um so I think it's I think that's really the distinction between cases of um private oppression, forced labor, um, as opposed to a, a state campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and then to respond to a state campaign, the suggestion is that we need some broader binding mechanism as mm -hmm. because the individual consumer really just doesn't have a chance. Mm -hmm. I want to um, invite everybody to offer your questions. Uh, those in the room, you can raise your hand. Let me know, signal in some way. Uh, do we have some questions? Okay. You have some questions from the online people, so let me start getting those 
into the conversation. All right, I'll ask, I'll raise one here and then I'll come back. Um, yeah, uh, to what extent, this is a very pertinent one because of course the marketplace is global. To what extent are other countries sanctioning goods or, or blocking goods uh, that originate from Xinjiang or that are suspected of using uh, Uyghur forced labor? Uh, they're not. It, to it, it, as far as I'm aware, the the big development here is last month the EU uh, Council and Parliament reached a provisional agreement to ban the entry of products made with forced labor. Uh, but the only country with a robust well, people would people would argue, but the only country that is that has put significant resources into uh, enforcing bans on forced labor is the United States. Hmm. Um, Contained within that question is, of course, maybe the question of how how can this even really matter if it's just the U.S. that's enforcing this? Aren't all of these goods going to be dumped elsewhere? Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a that's a serious concern. I mean, that's why the um, uh, the U.S. I think lobbied the EU quite heavily uh, on uh, this new agreement, um, and it's important to continue to try to roll that out. Um, as it is, uh, supply chain. Otherwise, um, one of the many ways of um, dealing with the UFLPA from the perspective of a Chinese exporter is to bifurcate your supply chain. Um, and that's entirely legal. You can say, okay, America doesn't want forced labor products. We'll have a separate supply chain for America and everyone else doesn't care. So they can, they can have uh, the rest. Um, that's a real live issue. I don't know that the answer to that is to, for the U S to give up on enforcement itself as well, but it's certainly, it's a, it's a long road and it's it, the, the prospects of, a future global regime in which all countries reject forced labor products, we're, we're pretty far away from that. Uh, yeah, I'm curious, you were talking about the immigration side of things. Yeah. And I think it's based on my limited experience. Uh, yeah, the problems with the asylum system and the length of time it takes is not unique to uh, the Uyghurs. Uh, but I there have been instances in the past, and I'm not an immigration expert, right, where I guess Congress has, you know, identified specific classes of people, right, to offer like a temporary mm -hmm. status. I don't remember if it was Haiti, I think. TPS, something, yeah. Something like that. And I was wondering, if, A, if there's any discussion or has been any discussion about that? And if so, why has that not moved forward? And I guess maybe just to set the table, you know, I know you're working on a bunch of cases. Do you have a sense of how many... Uyghurs there are who, you know, actively are seeking asylum at the moment or if granted that kind of status, but what that might look like? Yeah, lots, lots of great questions in there. So to, to start with your last one, the Uyghur American Association, which is the, you know, the main political organization of Uyghurs in the United States, um, their estimate as of a couple of years ago was 500 to 1,000 Uyghurs are currently pending asylum cases. I think that's probably about right. Um, I think there's probably, there has been, uh, I've noticed at least an increase in, uh, Uyghurs coming over the border into defensive proceedings, which is something that, um, really hadn't been happening very much, uh, prior to two years ago. Hmm. Um, coming from the South? Either. Coming over the border, the same, um, it's, Oxian, it's called in Chinese, you're probably familiar with it, fly to Ecuador where you have visa-free entry and then you you trek over land okay. um, across Darien. Um, I'm aware of many Uyghurs who have done that over the past uh, couple of years. Um, your question about TPS, um, that's generally, uh, I'm, I mean, I know it was put in place in after natural disasters. I'm not aware of TPS having been applied in the human rights context. There are there is legislation pending before Congress that would give Uyghurs priority to refugee processing. So that would give them something similar to what Afghans uh, now have. That 
to my knowledge, that would not have any impact on asylum applications pending in the United States. It could be very meaningful for Uyghur communities in places like Turkey, who feel increasingly precarious. Um, for priority processing of asylum applications, uh, there's, for one thing, uh, as far as I'm aware, DHS was not keeping data on like who was a Uyghur. Mm -hmm. I, you know, they knew they had, if you were a Uyghur, there wasn't, you know, you're a Chinese citizen. And so you're in that pool. So I think there, there's an inability, particularly for the, some of the older applications for DHS to even know whether someone is a Uyghur or not. Um, got you, me too. Yeah. That's, that's well, one suggestion that actually they've made in public letters uh, since the Trump administration, um, USCIS has, is you, you can file for expedited processing of your asylum application. And so there are there are Uyghurs with with cases that go back many years for whom it's is worth a shot, because at least you get the chance to tell the government I'm Uyghur. There are a lot of questions online as well about the asylum situation. Um, one one is whether um, in applying for asylum, are they hurt by the fact that they're Muslim? Not not to my knowledge. I'm not the so I'm actually not aware of a single case in which a Uyghur has been deported from the United States back to China, which would I, I suppose be the, the the key measure of success. Now, like within that. Um, yeah, I actually think uh, when we think about the passage of uh, the Uyghur Forced Labor uh, Prevention Act, I don't know, uh, but I th some of the political impetus uh, behind acts of Congress pertaining to Uyghurs, in fact, comes from concern, in many cases, on the right uh, about infringement uh, uh, upon religious freedoms. And so I think I don't I don't know that the fact that Uyghurs are Muslims weighs against them or for them. I think there, but I think there is symp great sympathy for uh, give, given everything we know about the limits on how Uyghurs can practice their faith. And there's there's sympathy for them as Muslims. So what is the main problem it, that they face in their asylum claim? Is it just that the process we have is so- The process is broken for everyone. It's not, it's not, so it's not to say, I'm not suggesting, and I don't think Uyghurs would suggest that um, they're somehow singled out for unfair treatment. It's more, look at this incredibly complicated UFLPA and all this other stuff that the US government is doing, and yet we can't send our kids to, you know, get our kids in-state tuition at UVA. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, yes, I mean, many, many people who are not Uyghurs are also suffering mm -hmm. from uh, how broken the U.S. asylum system is. Mm -hmm. I think just it's 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 a very clear case of how we are. It's, it's a bit of cutting our nose to spite our face if we think that in mm -hmm trying to keep Uyghur forced labor goods uh, out of our supply chains is so important, and yet we are not contributing to uh, fostering a robust Uyghur American community that mm -hmm. can advocate for those things. Mm -hmm. And is there a need for more lawyers who have Uyghur language skills or simply more lawyers willing to do pro bono? I So Uyghur language skills help. I mean, that's how I... I got into doing Uyghur asylum cases um, because it's, you know, it's nice to have an opportunity to practice my Uyghur and then also for um, a certain kind of client. Um, it's just very reassuring to, uh, particularly Uyghurs are fairly terrified of um, people who come here uh, not knowing anyone are terrified of being informed on of the government back home finding out about their, you know, who they are and what they're doing and going after their families. And um, there's a lot of coerced reporting on each other, um, there, what falls under the umbrella of transnational repression. And so to, to speak to someone who's clearly a foreigner and not part of um, those Uyghur social networks uh, who can at least attempt to explain the situation uh, that they're in that's very reassuring for a certain type of client. I don't know that speaking Uyghur is otherwise necessary to effective representation um, of Uyghurs. 
I do think that more attorneys uh, taking these cases would be helpful. I, in particular, I think um, law firms, uh, if, if there are law firms out there who wish to co-counsel on any of these cases, I'm very open. Um, start since 2016, uh, which is when I came back to the States from Istanbul and then was in law school and started hearing news about friends disappearing. Um, I, I spent some time asking around uh, big firms in the States. And uh, even to this day, I think it may be changing. It has to change. And eventually it has to change completely. But there still is a perception that if you have Chinese government clients, SOEs, um, or you have um, you know client interests that touch on China, then to take on a Uyghur asylum seeker represents a conflict of interest. Mm. Um, I, I'm of the view that this is total BS. We don't we don't talk about other populations in this way. We don't say that uh, you know a U.S. law firm that is representing the U.S. government in one matter then shouldn't represent an El Salvadorian in asylum proceedings, but somehow. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm genuinely not aware of major white shoe law firms that have taken on Uyghur asylum claims. Um, at the end of the day, we're not talking about a large volume of people, right? So there's the Uyghur American Association estimate, more people coming in, but we're talking about, I don't know, a thousand less, fewer, fewer than that. It's, it's not, it's not the biggest lift in the world, um, but it is, I, I'm not aware of a uh, major white shoe law firm that has done this work for years. And, and there aren't more claims because they simply find it difficult to get out. Yes, um, there aren't more there. And there are, yes, there are all sorts of issues with getting out. Um, most Uyghurs, the passport policy has changed constantly since I've been involved in studying the Uyghur region. Um, but broadly speaking, it's pretty difficult to get your hands on your passport. If you do have one, the, your local police station is supposed to keep it, keep it safe for you until you need it. And when you need it, you apply to them to get it. Um, the population that's borne the brunt of labor transfers, um, is, uh, you know, not an affluent one, not not the kind of people who will, probably would be getting a passport in the first place, um, and not the kind of people who have uh, the resources and networks, generally speaking, to be able to get out, um, because it can involve very complicated maneuvering depending on your situation. Um, I'm aware of some situations where Uyghurs have successfully managed to transfer their huko to a place that's not in Xinjiang, which has then enabled them to get a passport, which has then enabled them to get a visa. And, you know, meaning the register, their, their, their registered household registration. Um, if you are a Uyghur who manages to get your household registration switched into, you know, let's say, Hainan province, mm -hmm. your chances of uh, the authorities no longer taking much of an interest in you um, and also um, getting issued documents like any other PRC citizen is much higher. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, first of all, I mean, thank you, Dr. Xie Xie. I mean, <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I found it really, it's really informative, and I, I learned a lot. And and first of all, um, Xinjiang, um, yeah, my mom, my aunts, my uncles all, all come from Xinjiang, but obviously I'm not a worker, I'm just Han ethnic people. And uh, yeah, I learned a lot about, we, that's what we call the name, forced labor, or maybe we just re-education camp, maybe more exactly, right? Uh, and then as far as I know that the key point of this the re-education camp or maybe the labor force is not, I mean, just the labor is just the education, right? Because because of, I mean, because in this re-education re camp, they cannot use the uh, Uyghur language. We can have, have only use the Han language, but right? Chinese language. And then we learned a lot of Chinese culture class, like Beijing Opera, even the Northeastern comedy opera, like Iron Zhuan. Like just brainwash, obviously the propaganda because the only communism, only practice to save the Xinjiang, save the China, right? Because instead away from the terrorism, because there are a lot of terrorism, I mean, the attack in the past, especially in the 2009, I mean, the July 
seven states a big, I mean, demonstrate that big, I mean, attack in the, the capital city of Xinjiang, the Wumuchi. Yeah, the, the, the big issue. After that, I mean, there are a lot of, you know, the really educated camp since then. And also you can say oh, even the genocide in the southern part of Xinjiang. Yeah, and uh, I just, I, I just want to, Say that I mean the key point is more about the brainwash issue and propaganda issue rather than the labor force because contemporary now I mean we cannot you know pick the cotton by hand by hand just by machines instead of you know and uh, and yes thank you so much for let me know about this labor. Do you have a question? Uh, well, I think it sounds like you're maybe suggesting that um, among other th the key idea is indoctrination, yeah. not not actually the fruits of the the labor itself, right? And yeah. it seems like you're mentioning that mechanization yes. is one of the factors here, where actually there's maybe not really a need for forced labor. Um, I would I would dispute that that characterization. Um, I mean, in general, if you look at human history and the introduction yeah. of technology, um, mechanization uh, tends to actually mean more people working, not less. Um, uh, and there is this the one of the key uh, riposts by the Chinese government uh, on the forced labor issue is yes everything is is um very mechanized we how could we possibly and, and and the answer is in all sorts of ways you can use Uyghur forced labor one i mean another thing about them saying it's all mechanized mechanized it sort of implies that Uyghurs don't have the education level or sophistication to do mechanized jobs i don't know that that's the case either um cotton in southern xinjiang is still picked uh, at least partially by hand. Mm -hmm. um, quartzite, uh, which is the material that um, you mine and then refine into metallurgical grade silicon, which you then use to make uh, polysilicon and other products. That's that's all mined uh, by by hand. Um, uh, but you're right that it's 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 these it's a bunch of different uh, government objectives that are all intertwined. I mean, maybe the way to think about it is you say the importance is indoctrination. Yeah. Indoctrination is about control. Yes. Right. Control is expensive. Mm. Control is very, very expensive. Yeah. And so this is this is a way of you could see this as a way of subsidizing uh, a, a project that uh, the end aim of which is for Uyghurs to be somewhat assimilated, never totally assimilated into uh, mainstream Han Chinese culture, but, um, you know, made safe for participation in the global economy. Um, I don't know if that be, if that begins to address your... Yeah, thank you so much. And I also want to add on, because as for them, the blogging, this good comedies, product, how can we distinguish whether this, I mean, the comedies by, made by the, I mean, the Uyghur labor force or the the, Xin, the, the Xinjiang production and the construction costs. Because according to the logic of the CCP, they cannot tell, they will never tell you whether this product is made by the Uyghur people or by the Han people in Xinjiang. Right. That's that's where the rebuttable presumption comes in. Yeah. That's where the idea that just we can't, that exactly yeah, because the point. Every Chinese people, even, I don't know, because the only made in China, it's not made in Xinjiang, it's not made, made by this. Right. I mean, that, that's that's really the genesis of yeah. this very aggressive um, enforcement regime that we're kind of stumbling into uh, is is that the Chinese government is going to tell you Chinese companies. I mean, they'll tell you in that they will post publicly about it for the purposes of a domestic political audience, uh, but they're never going to openly share. Um, it's true. It, it, yeah. How? How? And, the, the, you know, it's it's you're trying to. Um, put a lot of this burden onto companies bringing goods into the United States to uh, gather every piece of information about their supply chain possible and their real limits to what they can accomplish there too. Let's focus on that a minute because you you talked about the the challenges faced by the company. Yeah. Right? You said they get a simple notice, they don't get a lot of details, they may not be told exactly what the issue is with their. So one person is asking, why are they not told? Um, you know, if unless they're the Customs and Border Patrol is trying to protect some kind of ongoing investigation where they have sources they want to, to protect or an individual whistleblower, 
what would be their reason for not saying more to the company, especially if that would help the company to address the problem? And then after addressing that, if you just give us a, a fuller picture of what this looks like from the company side, right. insofar as you know, like, so when they either prepare themselves in a more uh, proactive way to deal with compliance, or when they get a notice like this, what happens? Yeah. Um, maybe we can talk about the one piece of um, litigation that we've had so far uh, regarding the UFLPA um, filed by a company named Nine Star. Uh, they're a laser printer manufacturer, three billion plus in annual revenue. Um, they're the majority owner of Lexmark, which maybe is a familiar brand to folks here. They're in Kentucky. Um, Fledif added them to the entity list in June 2023. Um, uh, under category two for um, recruiting, transporting, transferring, harboring, and receiving Uyghur force labor. Um, they, and, and um, you know, so they received this notice. Um, it does give them an email address to follow up with, um, sort of vague instructions for what kind of evidence they might pr present um, in order to refute. Um, Nine Star, instead of engaging in that process, turned around and, and sued in the Court of International Trade. Uh, which uh, is not a court that I was previously familiar with, but Article Three Court um, that that has subject matter exclusive subject matter jurisdiction uh, over uh, uh, any any law connected to international trade. Um, and among uh, Lexmark's arguments uh, was. Uh, this is this is arbitrary and capricious. We were not get and unsupported by substantial evidence uh, because we have no ability to know or respond uh, to what we've been accused of doing. The government uh, reply. The government's response actually included um, the administrative record for the Nine Star case. There's a redacted public copy of it, and it is almost completely redacted oh. uh and it, it which is surprising to me mm -hmm. it it is clear that there is an anonymous informant uh who is key to these allegations that nine star employed forced labor um and so there is this this difficulty uh in terms of an ongoing investigation and what you can disclose mm -hmm. uh i think not nine star, but nine stars attorneys were permitted to review a somewhat less redacted uh, version of the administrative record in camera uh, with the judge. Uh, but we don't. I was I was also surprised to find that the entire administrative record was redacted because there's, it's one thing to have an informant who's giving you telling you X, Y and Z and sending you photos. Fine. But then there are also import export records. There's, I mean, even the US government itself um, yeah, said it was based on an allegation from an informant as well as um, the government documents, nine stars, company documents, and media reports. Mm -hmm. uh, presumably those were in the administrative record, but they were all redacted. Um, so, and I, I, I'm not sure that that's a, a satisfactory way to, um, adjudicate uh, in public. But I, again, I'm also not really familiar with all of the um, complexities involved when you have an anonymous. Mm -hmm. So this is still source. in process, this case? It's still in process. All that's been decided so far is that um, the, the Court of International Trade has, has gleefully um, ruled that it does have jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they have a wonky... Uh, administrative exhaustion provision that's specific to the Court of International Trade that at their discretion, uh, they don't require exhaustion in this case. So um, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's proceeding. Uh, preliminary injunction was denied. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the goods are still impounded. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see what happens, but um, I think there's... It, it is likely that DHS is going to continue to... Um, develop its its procedure for these adjudications and that there will be at least some more transparency. I think I even in the um, addendums that DHS has sent companies, 
with goods um, that have been excluded under the UFLPA, it's now it's now longer, and it, it now includes details on it, by industry what kind of information you should provide. Um, I saw something on a website about there being new questionnaires that they had issued, which were intended to guide companies through. There's, there's quite a lot of material on the DHS's website mm -hmm. um, to to try to assist companies. Mm -hmm. um, so how does a company prepare itself if the company is in textiles? Say, say I'm a, a clothing manufacturer, I'm a fashion company in the U.S. Um, what do I do? Where do I even begin? So your yeah, your the the thing about it is it's your responsibility. The the law places the onus on you to figure out what your supply chain is. Yeah. So you go ask your suppliers. I, I think the, the the basic idea is you go ask your suppliers and if they won't tell you, you find new suppliers until they do. Um, the complexities of supply chains are such that when you start asking these questions, no one really has the answer. And I think that's very much been the case. Um, and I think part of the idea of the law is that as enforcement ramps up, Company, everyone will be incentivized to understand the answers, and the U.S. is a big enough market um, that but we can enforce I, it. But if I if I ask my you know first or second or third tier contractor, um, you know the first tier may not know what the second tier is doing, and so on. Yes. And at a certain point, um, I may not get the truth back, right? And as you pointed out, auditors, independent auditors, are not allowed to um, to operate here, and even companies in the chain themselves may fear they're not allowed to disclose. Yeah. Right. So, so the Chinese company is not going to be in a position to tell me, yes, uh, it so happens that the next guy down is participating in one of these labor transfer programs or so on. They may feel this is information they can't share. So is the expectation or even the intent of this to cause me to source my goods completely somewhere outside China? I mean, this is this is another interpretation that I've seen given on the law that this is not really about the Uyghurs, sad as their situation may be. That this is really industrial policy. It's really about reshoring and you know changing how we make things and and uh, reshaping supply chains generally to bring them back home, consistent with the administration's policy. Now that seems a bit conspiratorial maybe, but not outrageous when you think about the difficulties that I, you know, the garment company face in getting anybody to actually tell me, uh, as long as I'm dealing at all with China, to tell me how my 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 cotton is produced or how my clothes are made. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to speculate too much about underlying intent, grand scheme um, to reshore manufacturing in the U.S. I mean, there are all sorts of other U.S. government policies that have been brought to bear on China and on our supply chains. Mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, the law is a tool and it's what everyone involved in it makes of it. And I, at least on the CBP level, I think there's genuine concern for uh, excluding goods made with forced labor and not so much concern for companies should just not deal with China. Uh, in, and in fact, it's not it's not as simple as companies just shouldn't do business in China because I think I attempted to get uh, that that data visualization site to show us you have shipments from Malaysia and uh, that have you know there are more shipments from Mal Malaysia have been excluded than from China itself. So you can try to move your supply chain. You can try to go to Southeast Asia, but your suppliers themselves are you know given mm -hmm. the amount the sheer quantity mm -hmm. uh, that China produces. Um, it, it is an attempt to try to deal with that. And, you know, one would help, one would hope uh, arrange incentives for Chinese companies in such a way that they won't use forced labor. We all know that it's it's more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's another question, a very good question that's been raised. What effect has it had so far? Can, is, is any, are any of those incentives being realigned as you described? I think there's been, I think the cumulative effect over time is going to be that companies 
uh, compile and have access to much more data about their supply chains. Mm -hmm. And th that this is viewed not, not just as, uh, this, this becomes viewed as a core compliance issue. Mm -hmm. um, there is, it's not a technological, there's no technological barrier to having data on where every single piece uh, of your supply chain originates. Um, there are data providers that have popped up, um, data analytics systems, a uh, whole, a whole new industry really starting. And I think that's, if you look at kind of the way things are headed, um, much more visibility. If you're talking about how can we help Uyghurs not be forced away from their villages to go work in factories, I mean, we, we have a very, we don't really have the ability to influence that. Um, and I'm not aware, I'm aware of uh, the UFLPA causing a lot of consternation among uh, Chinese suppliers uh, but in terms of rejecting a Uyghur forced labor transfer, because, you know, I, as a factory manager, know it's going to create problems for me. Maybe that happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's often pretty hard to refuse. Um, so if you think that the primary goal of the law is to help is to save the Uyghurs, then yes, I think it's it's disappointing. I'm not really sure uh, how much of it uh, that it can accomplish. Mm -hmm. The law is still, you know, among the most prominent advocates for the law uh, have been Uyghurs themselves, including Uyghurs with family in internment camps. Um, and I think there's also really, I mean, I, I come back to wouldn't call it the moral the moral aesthetics of it. There's there is some value, uh, I mm -hmm. think, for the average U.S. consumer in feeling like when you go to buy something on Amazon, mm -hmm. someone else did not suffer mm -hmm. to give that to you. And I think that's a that's what that that feels more achievable mm -hmm. uh, as a very ambitious goal mm -hmm. of this law than the liberation of the Uyghur people. So very quick final question, because we're almost at time. Uh, you mentioned the Uyghur advocates who work to make this happen, yeah. uh, which does seem like a pretty impressive feat. Yes. Um, at this moment in time, and they remain quite critical of enforcement, do they have specific suggestions for what should happen next? Sure, and I, I mean, I'd, I'd rather reference you to to individual people than attempt to to summarize it. Um, I don't think we got to talking about de minimis shipments. Um, the, these are um, shipments of eight hundred dollars or less that are excluded from like normal uh, inspection procedures. Um, and uh, there's, I think, there's quite a lot of anger among um, Uyghur advocates about that issue and what. There has not been. There's a there's a misunderstanding also of the de minimis exception, where CBP still has complete authority to uh, examine de minimis packages for contraband of any kind, including that made by forced labor. But it's there are so many of them, and they're very hard to investigate. And so, um, one big suggestion that people are making is to uh, lower the um, the threshold from $800 to $200. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, another thing that I think advocates are suggesting that has some point is just start start enforcing at least some shipments and see where we wind up. I don't think there's been any de minimis enforcement. So in other words, don't attempt to be 100%, just sample them. Just, just sample. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the companies involved will get scared and figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I also think the minute I it's in terms of volume, in terms of numbers of packages, it's huge. Mm -hmm. In terms of value of goods imported, it's not. It's right. it's maybe two percent out of the total well, you value. Can imagine this is every shirt or pair of socks or whatever it is that you're buying on Amazon. Yeah, or you know, or you go to like. Um, uh, Tamu or Xi'an, and actually you can, you you scroll down and like you can find all sorts of nice things for seven hundred ninety nine dollars. <laughs> um, 
Well, unfortunately, we have to stop here. There's more we could uh, discuss for sure, but thank you so much. This has been a fantastic discussion. I have learned a great deal. Um, so uh, we'll have to talk again maybe in another year or two and see how things have progressed. Sounds great. I think there will be a lot of progression by then, so I look forward to it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nate. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.